Welcome everyone to our Ask the Heart Doctor podcast and video at the Cleveland Clinic. I am Eric Roselli. I'm the surgical director of the Aorta Center at the Cleveland Clinic Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute. And I'm joined by my esteemed colleague and the medical director of the Aorta Center, uh, Melind Desai. We've received many really, uh, really excellent questions from many of you. Actually, we have pages of them in front of us, and we're looking forward to answering as many of these questions as possible. Many of them are redundant, and uh, as often uh, we do, every time we speak around patients together, Dr. Desai and I are going to address some of these questions, and we'll probably break this up into two sessions. So if you're listening to session one uh, and you enjoy it, please join us for session two. I think we should get started by addressing many of the questions that are appropriate to this current period of time, the, the pandemic that we're in, uh, that ask uh, specific questions about COVID risk associated with aortic disease. So uh, I thought this question was, was a very good one, Melinda. Maybe you can answer this for us. Are aortic aneurysms a pre-existing condition which make me more susceptible to the COVID-19 uh, virus and health issues, um, then this patient has uh, multiple aneurysms. So uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining, and thanks, Eric. Uh, so, you know, yes, we are living in very interesting and challenging times, and we are living in the big unknown, essentially, where we are learning every day as we go along. Now, one th uh, as d more and more data emerges, what we are finding out is that patients who have uh, cardiovascular risk factors that we all know of diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, they are more predisposed to uh, a complicated, uh, to developing COVID and developing a complicated form of COVID. Now, as best as we can tell, and again, we are still very early in our process of understanding this, just having a simple aortic aneurysm is not something that uh, puts you in harm's way uh, with regards to COVID. Now, you may have an aortic aneurysm because you have long-standing hypertension and you have atherosclerosis or plaque buildup. That could predispose you. Your heart function may not be good. You may be diabetic. That could predispose you, but just having a simple aneurysm does not put you uh, at an increased risk, at least as best as we can tell uh, today. I agree with that assessment, and, and several of the uh, similar questions also mentioned that the uh, patients who had similar questions mentioned that they had hypertension. I think hypertension certainly uh, continues to look like it's a real risk factor for this. I think it's also important for us to point out, though, that when you have an aneurysm, that if certainly if it's a large aneurysm and you've been recommended to have it repaired, you should not be afraid to go to hospitals to get that surgery done. The, uh, the aneurysm risk if it really is one that's, that's been recommended to have repair, may be higher than any risk associated with COVID. And what we've seen certainly in Northeast Ohio and Cleveland and in many parts of the United States is that hospitals, uh, certainly in the current prepared state, seem to be as safe as anywhere to go. I mean, cannot underscore the importance of that. There's, again, emerging data coming out from New York and Italy and some of the other hotbeds for COVID where the number of heart attack or patients presenting with heart attacks and aortic dissections, aortic aneurysms have gone down dramatically. It doesn't mean that all these diseases have disappeared from the face of this earth. It pretty much implies that patients are hesitant to come to the hospital for fear of contracting COVID. Now, that is not a good idea uh, because there are studies coming out of New York which have suggested that the in-house in deaths in this time frame of the pandemic have gone up by eight or 10 percent, uh, eight or 10 times. So not all of them are dying from COVID. They could be dying from some of the standard diseases that kill patients often, unfortunately. So the crucial message is a place like Cleveland Clinic uh, is extremely well suited to take care of patients like this from a cleanliness from a virus-free perspective, we have ensured processes which make sure that you, the patient, is safe. Uh, if, and if you were recommended surgery, then we have processes put in place which ensure your safety as well as safety of the caregivers uh, that form the team. Uh, 
with respect to uh, getting or not getting COVID. Yeah, and if I could just expound upon that, you did mention two really important studies. I think you know, one came out of New York where several of the hospitals in New York looked at their data over the last two uh, years and found a significant trend in the reduction of admissions for emergency aortic problems, dissection and aneurysm. And, and I think that's pretty clear. The reason why is because of the COVID-19, if you look closely at the trends over time. And a separate study out of Italy, looking in the northern regions of Italy, demonstrated that out-of-hospital cardiac arrest deaths correlated directly with COVID-19. And it's pretty, I think, safe to assume that those deaths occurred because people were delaying their care. And so, again, uh, uh, cardiovascular deaths still represent the highest cause of death in human beings, certainly in the developed world, and uh, you need to make sure you seek that care. Another question uh, regarding surgery uh, came from a, a couple of patients who asked about their COVID-19 risk after they have repair. One patient uh, has a homograft aortic valve, wonders if that puts them at any increased risk. And the other one mentions that they had an aneurysm repair and repair of a bicuspid valve. Does that put them at any risk? I would probably say the same though yeah. to your answer before. Exactly. Doesn't put them at any elevated risk uh, other than the fact that in general, if you have a prosthetic valve, whether it's a homograft or a biologic or a mechanical valve, you need to do all the other things that you need to do to prevent that valve from getting infected when you have dental procedures, et cetera. But no, no, no particular, nothing really that we know of that puts you at an added risk. Having said that, it is still important to do the right things with social distancing and, and, and all the things that follow the guidelines, uh, you know. But, you know, for the most part, this does not predispose you at a higher risk. Great. Okay, I think that's enough of the COVID stuff. I, yeah. Yeah. I think I'm ready. We have plenty other places to talk exactly. about that and read about that. Exactly. Let's move on to this next set of questions. I thought it was a very uh, nice group of questions here that Betsy put together. Uh, she compiled them into groups for us where um, patients had questions about healing after they've had a dissection uh, or um, uh, questions about the seriousness of their aneurysm. Uh, one of the questions was, is if my aneurysm has been stable for five years, uh, and I was told to stop there. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Is this true? Um, I guess the question is, if your aneurysm has been stable for four or five years of monitoring, um, what can you look forward to in a patient? And what is the sort of lifelong plan for that patient? I, I think if they've been told to stop, that's an error. I think they need to have a lifelong plan. Can you expound okay. upon that? So, yes. I mean, again, everything has to be put in the big picture and context. So uh, if you have an aneurysm or an aorta that has remained stable, doesn't mean you stop after, uh, screening them or, or if following them after five years. Uh, you may alter the plan of frequency of testing. You may, uh, but, but regardless, you still need to keep following them up. Now, uh, I mentioned context. If you are 90 years of age and your aorta has been uh, just slightly dilated and it has remained so for the last five, 10 years, yes, you know, you, your risk from a, uh, dying from an aortic aneurysm rupture if your aorta is, uh, is only four centimeter is much lower than, uh, than, not, uh, than other causes. On the flip side, if you are a 30 year old patient with a aorta that is 4.2 centimeters uh, and has remained stable for five years doesn't mean we stop uh, looking after you, taking care of you uh, at that point of time. And more importantly, it's not just about following precisely the measurements and the progression, but also making sure that you, uh, your risk factors, uh, hypertension especially, body weight, et cetera, are controlled and somebody is monitoring that, and you know somebody focusing you on those issues uh, throughout the progression. Aortic disease is a lifelong disease. You know, if you have an aortopathy, it's a lifelong problem. If you have a repair of an aortic aneurysm by a surgery or what have you, it still is a lifelong problem because uh, you could develop complications or degeneration of material, et cetera. So, stopping after five years is not a good idea. 
Yeah, I agree. So, you know, another question was, can an aortic dissection be cured? And, and you know, thinking about that question and your statements, you know, if, I, I think it's important for us to just step back a little bit. We talk about aneurysm and dissection as though they're separate disease states. But I think what we really need to do is talk a little bit about what we don't know, right, and what we do know. And what we do know is that the reason that people develop aneurysms or dissections, or at least in, you know, in a general sense, is because there has been some ongoing underlying degenerative process happening in the wall of their aorta, right? Your aorta is supposed to handle the load of your heart ejecting against it throughout a lifetime. It's supposed to maintain its integrity and repair itself. And in many people, it just can't. That poor aorta takes a beating all day long, right? And in some people, it just can't. And so we talk about aneurysm and dissection because those are those late stage sort of problems that develop in an aorta that's de been degenerating over a really long period of time. Um, but it's probably the manifestation of a whole bunch of different disease processes that sort of funnel into this mechanical problem that we see. So can you be cured of a dissection? Well, not, not really, because you're always left with that sort of underlying problem that's happening at a cellular or a matrix level, a and, microscopic yeah, level, yeah, right? And, exactly. And, and, you know, so dissection, what, I mean, you, know, you have an aorta that is predisposed to getting bigger, uh, aneurysmal, and then once it reaches a certain threshold or there's some bad hemodynamic compromise which results in a tear of the aorta which is known as a dissection. Now your Im imaging findings may improve or remain stable over the years but your underlying predisposition, your underlying problem never really goes away which is why these uh, patients with these issues can need to uh, be maintained or followed up closely over the years. Another good question here um, is are there any connection between aneurysms of the aorta and aneurysms of the brain? In some scenarios, yes, there are connections. Uh, like, for example, some inherited cardiomyopathy, I mean, some inherited aortopathies like Lois D syndrome, yes, absolutely, there is connections. And in fact, in, in a patient with Lois D syndrome uh, that we know has Lois D syndrome, it is strongly recommended that their, all their arteries from uh, North Pole to South Pole, from brain to the lower extremity, they are scanned periodically to make sure there are no new aneurysms uh, developed. So not all aneurysms uh, are associated, but there, is, there are some uh, where there is. And this is an evolving science. We don't really know everything about everything just yet. There are some uh, diagnoses, some aortopathies that still remain to be fully characterized where we could uh, learn more. Yeah, and some of the ACTA2 uh, variants also are prone to develop aneurysms. We've seen some really severe cases of that. And so I think, um, as, you're, as you've alluded to, it's a growing area. What we do in all of our preoperative patients is make sure they have some brain MRI or MRA imaging to rule out aneurysms. Um, we've probably gotten to a point now where we've got enough data we can kind of call that and get a sense. Um, the problem is I'm not sure we really know what the natural occurrence of some of these sort of subtle findings is, but, uh, but we'll learn more. There'll be more to come to answer that question. But certainly, yeah, there is some risk for developing aneurysms in other beds, especially if you're a younger person with a familial cause or a, genetic, or a clearly genetically triggered cause. Uh, it's important that your doctor screen for all of those things. What about symptoms, Malin? You know, it's funny, so many patients talk about uh, um, how they found their aneurysm was because they were being worked up for some symptoms like a chest pain or some discomfort, something that probably wasn't the aneurysm, but it brought it to their attention. And then, of course, it's impossible not to focus upon that going forward. Do the aneurysms cause symptoms? Are there subtle symptoms that So, that occur? in general, what I tell patients is as follows, is aneurysm by itself should not cause problems unless it gets too big and unwieldy. It's in a confined space and if it starts to compress some other organ, so if it compresses your food pipe, the esophagus, then you may have issues related. If it impacts your uh, ability to speak, uh, the hoarseness of voice, all those things. But overall, in general, aneurysms don't cause symptoms. 
a lot of times what ends up happening is the first time patients realize they have something bad going on with their aorta is when they have this acute, severe crushing, never seen before, never experienced before type chest pain that, uh, you know, then it's a dissection and that's prob that is the first time they have a symptom related to that. Now, occasionally, things go hand in hand. So if you have an aneurysm and you have coronary artery disease blockages, you may have angina that takes you to the doctor and then as part of the workup, you end up uh, identifying aortic aneurysm. In fact, this morning, I saw a patient uh, that Dr. Roselli is gonna see later today. You know, the, the patient has atrial fibrillation and he was being worked up for that and as part of the workup, he had a scan which showed an aneurysm which requires surgery. So, you know, and he has absolutely no symptoms related to that. So that is more often the norm than the, the, the subtle symptoms that I described. Before. Yeah, my response is, is usually, you know, the aneurysm doesn't cause you symptoms until you're dying from it. Yeah. So it's an emergency situation. And, and people want to know what that might be like. Uh, I talk to all my patients who've survived those emergency situations and, and inquire about them. We actually have a couple papers and in, in, uh, one in press about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder associated with that event and some others that we're working on where we surveyed patients about it. And the one thing that is consistent about it, it's abrupt. It's really abrupt. I tell them one story of one of my patients that I, th that I think is really good. It, it's sort of instructive to folks who want to know like, how am I going to know if this is happening to me? You know, we, we usually tell them when we find it, we're going to fix it before that happens, of course. But the, one of my patients was telling me he was playing golf with his friends. He was on the tee box. He was about to tee off when the dissection occurred. He thought that one of his friends was taking a practice swing and hit him between the shoulder blades with the golf club. Thank God that wasn't his friend that did that. <laughs> That'd be a bad thing. But, um, and thank God he got the care he needed to get his dissection taken care of. But it comes on that abruptly. It's not always pain in the chest or between the shoulder blades or what's described as this ripping or tearing sensation, but it's always abrupt in onset, oftentimes stops you in your track. We found actually that 15% of people were woken up from sleep from it, which I thought was a pretty high number. And it's something that's usually not subtle. You know, if it's not like this tearing, ripping pain in your chest or your back, um, it's some sensation that, you know, you need to get some help. And, and an important thing, like you said, it is abrupt. It does not always have to be associated with heavy exercise. A lot of people, you know, if I'm lifting, that's when, no, that's not the case. Often uh, it happens when you are sedentary, what have you migrating pain so you know you, you it may start in the chest it may go between shoulder blades now depending upon how extensive the dissection is uh, you know you if it's involving the brain vessels you your presentation could be a stroke like symptom uh, or severe abdominal pain like symptom so you know there is no real one one size fits all situation so it is that is important to to keep in mind often not often, but occasionally, uh, if the aorta, God forbid, ruptures, then you are in shock. You could drop your, the, the initial presentation of that patient could be sudden death on the field. So, so it, it has a full spectrum. Certainly, um, if you have a pre-existing aneurysm, we have plans in place to fix those before that kind of thing happens. And, uh, and when it done, does happen, it's, it's usually not, not a mystery. Yeah. Uh, you know your history. You share that with the caregivers that you go to if you're calling 911. And um, unfortunately, in, in certainly in the United States, we have many really great emergency medical systems that will get you to uh, a place where you can get that care. Now, um, uh, let's say you've been diagnosed with an aneurysm uh, and, uh, and you want it monitored. Well, let's talk a little bit about this sort of monitoring and diagnostic plans. What is, the best, what is the best test, the best imaging technique to monitor these aneurysms? Let's say I, I'm diagnosed with a 4.7 centimeter ascending aortic aneurysm. So again, the answer is there is some nuanced thought process. A lot, I mean, you know, uh, it depends upon where the aneurysm is. If it is close to the heart and the valve, uh, then, you know, and I will start from uh, less complicated or le uh, imaging and beyond. So, you know, if it is close to the valve, you need to know how the valve, the aortic valve is, is competent or not. So an echocardiogram 
is, should be essentially the first line diagnostic modality. It answers a lot of questions there. But it is important, crucial, in fact, to realize that echocardiography has, ultrasound and echocardiography has many, many shortcomings as it relates to aortic aneurysm diagnosis. Uh, first, uh, it, it does not uh, image the entire length of the aorta. Second, uh, the, just the way the measurements are made, they could be off be, based on a tangential ultrasound beam. So to, to answer the question in a simple way, every world-class aorta deserves a tomographic scan at least once. I mean, I joke that with tomographic, my Tomographic, you mean a CAT yes. scan or an MRI, So right? tomographic. Something scans through the whole, exactly. the whole aorta. What's a tomographic scan? It could be either a CAT scan or an MRI, but the bottom line is it, it scans through the whole extent of the aorta and then we can reconstruct it in, in a three-dimensional space to uh, precisely measure aortic uh, size. Now, our bias is uh, CT, a contrast-enhanced CT is a lot more accurate, uh, especially if done right with gating, et cetera. It is a lot more accurate. And if we are serially monitoring stuff, uh, uh, and if you need precision, CT is pretty darn good at that. And that is our institutional bias. But CMR, cardiac MRI, is also re pretty much just about as good. And so when you are, when you, if you have a patient who is young and you are concerned about radiation exposure, et cetera, and you know that they may need serial follow-up for a long time, then you could uh, do CMR assessment uh, as opposed to CT. But, but the way I look at it, if your question is precise measurement and precise follow-up of aortic aneurysms, uh, you definitely need a tomographic assessment. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, we're, we're screening. We often start with an echocardiogram that helps us to see the first part of the aorta. We also get to look at valves, heart function. That's really helpful. And if we're really suspicious and, we, and we, you know, we truly think we need to evaluate this whole aorta, which is oftentimes the case if someone's coming with an aortic diagnosis, then we want to get a CAT scan or an MRI. Um, we think that the CAT scan may be a little more precise um, it's certainly easier to get for folks, but um, uh, the downside is that you have radiation exposure. And so uh, I think well, one of the things we like to establish early on is whether there's been any rapid growth. So we might get a couple of scans within, what, about six months? Is that typically what you do? That's usually yeah. what I'm, yeah. So we'll get a scan within six months of each other to make sure things are stable. And if it looks like it's in one of these sort of smaller sized aortas that we think we're going to be watching for a long time in a younger patient, we may switch over to MRI to avoid radiation. And if it's like it's nearing uh, the point where we might recommend treatment and we want to be a little more precise with regards to recognizing some subtle differences, we might go back to CAT scan. Does that sound yeah, like a that good is summary? Exactly, that is exactly, that cool. is a perfect summary. Great. Exactly. Great. Okay, um, I think that should do it for our first session. We talked a little bit about why aneurysms occur, how we monitor them, some of the risk factors, a little bit of the COVID-19 questions. I hope that was helpful to many of the folks out there that sent us questions. Thank you for doing so. We will chime in in just a little bit with round two when we're going to focus on treatments, both medical and surgical, and some questions about that. Thank you. Thank you.